Welcome to Santa Rosa SDA Journey. Please remember Sonoma County's mask mandate. When you are in church, please wear a mask. Next Friday, September 10th, there will be a Vesper service at the sanctuary led by Pastor Brown. Baptism of Herbert Remus. Herbert Remus will be baptized next Sabbath, September the 11th, after the church service, about 2 p.m. Please bring your own chair if you wish to sit, and there will be refreshments provided after the baptism. Memorial service for Carol Needham. There will be a memorial service for our longtime member, Carol Needham, next Sabbath, September 11th, at 4.30 in the sanctuary. All are invited. Book sale. The next book sale will be September the 18th, after the church services in the buying set. Come and find Ellen White books, Bible books, commentaries, children's books. They're all free. Baptism of Raquel's son, Brandon. Brandon will be baptized on September the 18th at Rio Lindo Adventist Academy at 5 p.m. A new time for the gathering. Starting next quarter, on October 2nd, the gathering will begin at 9.30 a.m. and Sabbath school classes will begin at 9.45 a.m. Christian Women's Retreat. There is now a definite venue for the Christian Women's Retreat. It will be at Pacific Union College on the following dates. October 15 to 17 and October 22 to 24. Please check the website for more details about the program and registration.
You may be seated. Happy, happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath. Um, so, as you heard earlier from Keith, there's a lot going on. I just wanted to reemphasize um, the uh, memorial service for Carol Niederman. That is September, September 11th at 4.30 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Um, and so before we get started this morning, I, I really enjoyed that uh, exercise we did. Uh, was that last? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, uh, where we got into groups and kind of introduced each other. Um, we're trying to create a family atmosphere in the church, and I think we all feel that. Would you agree with that? And so to that end, this morning I would like... Uh, I would like us to greet each other, and I challenge you to not only greet those you know, but also to greet somebody you don't know, and just make a connection. Let's connect this morning. Happy Sabbath.
Lord. Thank you for bringing us all here today, this special Sabbath, because it is your day, and we need to remember that. And be with all the people that are here. I have some friends from Lake Tahoe that have had to evacuate, and we, have, we thank you for their safety and that they can be here today with us worshiping you. And be with the families that are mourning the near and family. Wrap your arms around them and know that they are loved. And I also saw that we have a couple baptisms coming up. And praise the Lord, more members for our family. And Lord, be with us during these trials and, and craziness that's going on in our world. We know that you're in charge and help us to focus on you. And as the song says, surrender to you. You're all we need. So help us through this next week. And please be with Pastor Brad as he gives your message today, that it can touch our hearts. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Scripture today is Luke 19, 1 through 4. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Now it is time for children's story. So all of you young ones out there, it is time for a special story. And as you come up to the stage, if you see someone with a wallet, Four, I got three little boys, I got three little boys, one, two, three, 
and they love to go to the Target toy aisle. Now we have two, I have to tell you, we have two kinds of chores in our house. We got two kinds of chores. And so first are the ones that they have to do every, every day or, or on Friday to get ready for Sabbath. And those are the ones that just expected that we're just part of the family. Well, then there's extra chores. Do you guys have extra chores? And that might be something a little bit harder, like weeding mommy's flowers right outside. And those, they get to earn a little bit of money. That's why your parents have you for children, because then they can do the work that they don't have to do, right? That's right, okay, okay. okay. So our three boys, Monday through day, love the toy aisle Target. So they work some of those extra chores to earn some money. Have you guys ever done that? Yeah? I'm going to tell a story about Soren today. He told me I could. You still good with it? It's a little late now, man. We're kind of in it, so... Okay, good. So, Soren and Simon and Slate had been saving up their money. They had been... They just like... They got money. We have a, a jar. Each of them has a jar at home. And that's where their money goes. They see the dollar bills like you guys. And you guys are good. Like, man. I could raise a lot of money. You guys go out and collect stuff for me, okay? But they had jars, and man, those, that money was stacking up. So I'm, Daddy, can we go to, can we go to Target? And Simon, can we go to Target, Daddy, please? Slate, I want to go to Target. Okay, so I'm not the one that takes them to Target, let's be honest, that's Mommy's realm, right? Like, that's where, yeah, yeah, Mommy has got frequent flyers there, okay? So she takes the three boys to Target to look. They got that money, they're gonna spend some money, right? And Slate picks out, what are those little ball things that you like in? Uh, what are they, Simon? Bakugan? I don't know what those are. I have no idea what that is. Okay, so he gets the little balls, the little transform, and I think Simon got one of those. Well, Soren, he sees this airplane, and his Uncle Mark loves airplanes and take him to like, the Air Museum and stuff like that in San Rosa, and so loves it. And he sees this firefighter airplane. Oh man, it's bright red. You can fit all these cars in it, and it looks amazing and shiny and new. And he decides it's a little bit more than he, that we said he could spend, but he made a deal with mommy and said, "Can I spend a little bit extra and get this airplane?" Mommy said, "All right." The next time we do this, not as much. Okay, so he buys this airplane. A couple days later, let's say two, and I know this doesn't happen in anybody else's house, but Soren was playing with Simon's little toy, that he had a brand new toy, and Simon was throwing a little bit of fit, yeah? Go ahead. Yeah, maybe, okay. Soren, go ahead. And then we told Simon, Okay, you can share, but Soren, that's his brand new toy, right? And then Soren kind of went over to Slate and started playing with his little thingy that I don't remember the name of again. And we said, Soren, this is not what you're supposed to be doing, you have your own. And he came up to me and he said, but what I got wasn't what I wanted. We said, you tell what you took, nobody pushed you, man, right? You remember that conversation? Nobody pushed you to get that. It was exactly what you wanted. The box was so pretty, and he said, but the wings, these are, this is the exact one, the wings fall off, and it only fits like two cars in it, and it wasn't anything like I wanted. So we had a really good conversation then about, in the Bible, when Samuel is looking for a king, and he sees King Saul. And King Saul looks tall and handsome. And God says, or Saul, but that God looks on the heart. Man looks out on the inside, on the outside, right? That's what Sora looked at. He saw that shiny box, he saw that gray airplane, and it was what he thought it was gonna be. But sometimes, it's just a shiny package, right? But I also want to go ahead and give you guys a little brain twist as well. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the stuff that doesn't look that great, it's what's on the inside that really matters, right? What's on the inside, guys? What's in your heart 
Are you kind on the inside? You love Jesus? Are you looking out for your brothers and your sisters and your friends? That's what matters, is the inside. Because oftentimes, if we just look at the outside, we get a little disappointed, right? Like Soren was disappointed with what he got at Target. Can I pray with you guys? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you look at our hearts, that we are not tied to what's on the outside. Please bless these kiddos. Help them to love their neighbors. Help them to have a great Sabbath day. We love you. In your name, amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Am I on? I'm on. I think I'm on. I may be on. I'm not on. I'm just loud. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I needed to hear. It is wonderful to know that Jeannie is here. Happy Sabbath, Jeannie. I have a, a couple uh, announcements for you, uh, extra announcements or uh, extra highlight in announcements. One is a story, the other is uh, uh, more of a plea. Uh, when I was a young pastor, I wound up at a lot of, of fairs at different college campuses. And I would, all, I would always call ahead and register, you know, I'm Seventh-day Adventist, and I'd get to the fair and they were all in the same area, all these different colleges, and they would always sit my booth right next to the same booth every time. And it was the booth of the Quakers. So I don't know if it was just like, hey, these are two weird denominations, let's put these guys together, or what? But I always wound up right next to the, the Quakers. And so me and Mr. Quaker had a really interesting relationship, and, and, and got a lot of chance to talk together because no one came to our booths. And, and I found out that the Quakers, when they worship, they do something really interesting. They gather together, and they have no plan. They don't have a bulletin. They don't have a, a sermon prepared. They just gather together, and for as long as they decide to stay there, they just allow the Holy Spirit to inspire whoever shows up with whatever they're inspired by. And he told me, some, some weeks we get together and it's silent for an hour and a half. Which I had to ask, do you have kids? <laughs> because that's, I, and we love that, we love that noise here. That's, that's the noise of life. If you don't like the, the, the crumpling of papers and the whispering of parents, you're in the wrong building. Because that's the future speaking. That's the noise of the future. Some Sabbath days, some weekends, they come together and people are sharing songs and scriptures and testimonies and everything else. Vespers is coming up next Friday. We are having a Quaker esque Vespers. In this sense, I'm going to give you a week. Seven o'clock next Friday night, we will be here. If the Holy Spirit inspires you to share a song, share a, a verse, share a testimony, share a, a, a skit, a sculpture, a painting, uh, I don't know what, bring it. And we're going to just see what the Holy Spirit puts on our hearts and minds as a church family over the next week and express that together next Friday night here at 7 p.m. If you can make it, we'd love to have it. Now, connected to that, I have a plea. It's connected to Herbert Rivas. Those of you who don't know Herbert, he is uh, Carmen's father. Carmen, wave your hand. Everybody say hi, Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Carmen's amazing. She does everything around here. Amen. Her dad is being baptized next Saturday up at Rio Lindo Academy. In the, in the water, we'll hand out maps to get to find where we're going next week, about 2 o'clock. Bring a potluck. We're going to kind of eat and have a, a, a time of it. But, so please be there to support her. And next weekend, now I, I, this is a rarity. There's, there's a grand slam for pastors. I don't know if you're aware of this. There, there, there are four things a pastor really does. There, there's weddings. There is memorial services. There is baptisms. And there's baby dedications. Now, next week, and I am, I've got three for four. So if anyone has a baby, 
<laughs> if you have a baby and they like they don't need to be newborn, just just find a baby and bring that child to church, and we will dedicate the baby. We can hit for the grand slam as a church family. It doesn't have to be your baby. <laughs> Kristen and I, my wife Kristen and I, we we got married forever ago. It seems longer some weeks than others. And and before we were married, we did about a year of long distance relationship. She graduated from college. I still had a year left in college. So she was living in Colorado, and I was here uh, living in Santa Rosa. And it was really tough. That that began only a couple months after we started dating. We started dating right at the end of the school year. She graduated and was gone. And so over the summer, we, we did our best to sort of travel from one state to the next so we could have time to, to, to develop our relationship. And over Fourth of July weekend, she had told me all about the plans that she had in Denver and, and what she was going to do with her friends and family. And, and I didn't really have plans. I was just kind of working in fact i was working here at this church as an intern and uh didn't think of it, anything of it late at night friday evening i'm i'm at home getting ready for bed and my my phone rings and it is Kristen. she says hey will you open the front door what? there she was she she had snuck her way from colorado to <laughs> to California, absolutely, I was floored, absolutely one of the, the best surprises of my life. So good, in fact, by, that by the end of the weekend, we were engaged, and that was not the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Careful with your surprises, I guess it's the moral. <laughs> we enter scripture today in the book of Luke for a surprise. Luke chapter 19, I encourage you to follow along with us in your, in your Bibles, on your phone, or in, in hand. Luke chapter 19, beautiful story that is told, and it, it is surprising in a number of ways. We pick it up right away in verse 1. He, that is Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see those who Je or he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Kids, you you know this song. Climbed up the for the Lord he wanted to see. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it for full. Our clicker, you just have to have the right touch. It's like trying to control the TV around my kids. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, today salvation came to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I love this story for a whole lot of reasons. In, 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 in the most basic sense, this is Jesus offering a succinct version of his personal mission statement. His motto, if you will. The Son of Man, that's himself, came to seek and save the lost. That's why I'm here. That's all, what I'm all about. And, and I love the story of Zacchaeus because it so beautifully and simply communicates the heart of Jesus and how he goes about doing that. Let's look at more with more care at the story. Jesus enters Jericho. Now it's jumping around. This is amazing. <laughs> Jesus entered Jericho 
Christine, you might have to help me this week. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, I'll stop there for a second because let's talk about tax collectors. If you've spent any time around the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know that tax collectors were like specifically abhorrent, which is to say, I guess not a lot has changed. <laughs> they, they were specifically disliked. In fact, oftentimes when tax collectors are referred to, they, they'll say something like, whoa, he's with sinners and tax collectors because they need their own category. There's like, there, there's the sinners and then there's the tax collector, right? <laughs> Now, tax collectors were abhorrent for a number, number of reasons in this specific culture. They were collecting taxes for the Romans, who sort of were overruling, had the th their thumb over the lives of the Jews. So in essence, Zacchaeus is a Jew who is working for the people running the show over the Jews. So in that sense, there's a very much a sense, this, he is a traitor to us. And it's not just that he is, he's doing something wrong, it's that he is a traitor. He's against our whole nation. He should, he should know that. But there is an added sort of difficulty with Zacchaeus, especially the tax collectors in general. During Jesus' time, there was a very basic and linear understanding of what it meant to be blessed by God. If you were wealthy, everyone assumed that you were in good with God. You were wealthy because you had God's favor. If you were sick, you were sick because God had didn't like you. And there's this very direct relationship between your, your state of life and the sense that everyone around you had about your relationship, your positive relationship or negative relationship with God. But tax collectors, they trouble that theory deeply. Because here are people who very clearly are against God's people, and yet they are wealthy. So in a culture that views, well, God's favor is, is understood through life status, a tax collector is a particularly troubling person. Here's someone who's doing well and doing horrible things to get it. it. It flies in the face of what they thought about God. Here, Zacchaeus is sort of like the chief amongst sinners. He's the chief tax collector, and he's not just rich. He is very rich. If you were a Jew and you were reading about Zacchaeus, this would be like immediately, I have been introduced to the worst part of the story. This is the criminal. This is the antagonist. Zacchaeus, chief tax collector and rich. And we're told he, he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But account, on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So Zacchaeus has two main problems. His primary problem is actually not his stature. His primary problem is the crowd. Right? Zacchaeus is interested. Jesus has come to town. There's crowds of people there to see him. He wants to see Jesus. And when Zacchaeus shows up, the crowd, when he is trying to, hey, can I just sweep? Can I just, I know there's room. I'm really short. You can see over my, the crowd isn't having it. First and foremost, his issue is the crowd is not interested in letting him see Jesus. How, how dare this man? You can imagine them saying, come to see the rabbi, a, a hero of the Jews. And this criminal, this crook, this sinner thinks he, he deserves to, to go see him, that he, he should be able to, to step in front of me. It's a crowd. You, you can feel the tension in the air as he is trying to squeeze his way through. And we know that Zacchaeus was very, very persistent. Seemingly, he, he really wanted to see Jesus. Because as the story continues, for us, we, we will read the, a couple of verbs here and not think much of it, but we need to 
We have to see it. Verse 4. So he, Zacchaeus, ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. If you were a Jew and you were reading this story, and you read those two verbs, that Zacchaeus ran and Zacchaeus climbed, it would be impossible to believe that it was true. Impossible. It, it was absolutely unheard of for a man of any stature, much less a wealthy man, to do something like run and even less so climb in the days of Jesus. In fact, there are many famous stories in the Middle East of, of, of sort of, of elders of the community that, that instead of saving their own lives to get out of the way of traffic or some kind of danger and running, to, to, to save face and not experience shame, they, they will actually die rather than run in public or at all. And the reason for that in Jesus' day had a lot to do with propriety. The outfit of the typical Jewish man was essentially two pieces, maybe three. You wore an undergarment that was a tunic. It was basically just a, do you, do you know what a mumu is? <laughs> All right. It's a mumu. It's a single sort of long shirt that you pull down over your head and it covers to about mid-thigh. That, that was your underwear. That was your undergarment. Everybody wore it. And then over that, you would put a robe that sort of added more cover and a belt. So in, in the days of Jesus, if someone was around in just their tunic, they, that was actually considered naked because your legs are showing, your ankles are out. Like it's, the, the wind is blowing. It's not good. <laughs> so to run, because you have a long robe, the reason it was so shameful is you would have to actually sort of hike up your robe a little bit. Women, you know what I'm If you're wearing a long dress and you need to run, you've got you to pull things up. And now all of a sudden this, this elder of the community, wealthy, dignified man is like, he's not in athleisure. Lululemon wasn't then what it is today. <laughs> So that it, it is impossible to think that they would run because they'd have to sort of show off some leg. Even more so, he climbs a tree. Now, I'm not going to get too gratuitous with this, but just to be clear, your underwear is a long shirt. <laughs> so if it is too shameful to run and pull up your, your, your robes a little bit, it is incredibly shameful to climb a tree because you understand it's breezy up there, all right? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the desperation that Zacchaeus displays in this scene is unbelievable. I mean, this is a key cornerstone of the community and he is essentially in a tree above a crowd in the middle of the day, experiencing the breeze. <laughs> he really wants to see Jesus. He is desperate to see Jesus. It's the only conclusion to make. He, it, at this point, his reputation is nothing to him compared to how badly he wants to just set his eyes on Jesus. The, the, the opinion, the, the, the ridicule that he might receive, he's considered it nothing. In fact, opened himself up to even greater criticism. All for the chance of glimpsing Jesus. And so it is no wonder, verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. This is a moment of absolute tension for Zacchaeus. This is, this is, this is absolutely the most tense moment of his life. You cannot imagine that what was going on in his stomach, where his heart was pounding as he saw Jesus stop beneath the tree. 
as he saw Jesus look up, as the crowd around Jesus stops, as the crowd looks up. What's he going to do? He, he is wondering, is Jesus going to be like everybody else? Is Jesus going to look at me and see nothing but the worst of sinners? Is he going to ridicule me? This is, this is the precipice for Zacchaeus. Jesus gets it in an instant. He, he sees the heart of Zacchaeus, past the labels, past his history, past everything about him. He sees his heart and understands here is a man who is willing to give up everything for me. Zacchaeus, please come down for I'm going to your house today. But those are the most beautiful words that man has heard in his life. To be invited into the home of someone during Jesus' days was an incredibly significant thing. To, to be able to host a dignitary like Jesus was an incredible honor. It's no wonder the crowd, and when Jesus makes this pronouncement, immediately begins to grumble. How dare this man go into the home, eat with a sinner like that? Jesus has honored him deeply. The, 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 the culture, sort of the saying was that the guest is the Lord of the home. That was the way people were treated. If you, you brought a guest into your house, they ran the show when they arrived. It, Zacchaeus is very much being told, I am willing to come into your life and be the Lord. That's what Jesus is saying to him. And so he, he hurries down the tree and brings him into his home joyfully. We'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I'm giving up. The crowd is grumbling, but Zacchaeus, at this point, you, you almost see his life, his, his joy is such that it, it doesn't even seem to affect. The, the crowd at this point, they, they have been exposed. They were unwilling to let him see Jesus, and now the one most unwelcome is now the one getting the welcome. He enters into his home, and Zacchaeus is so moved by the experience. You can see them around the table, and Zacchaeus stands and says to the Lord, says to Jesus, and why is he the Lord? He's in his house. Says to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. This is Zacchaeus' conversion. The half of what I own, this chief tax collector who is very rich, I just wholesale, I give it to the poor. Anyone I've robbed, I give them four times what was taken. When you read the Bible, you, you understand a little bit more what Zacchaeus is saying. In Leviticus chapter 6, there's laws about how you're supposed to restore the goods of someone that you've stolen from. And the rule was, according to Leviticus chapter 6, if you steal from someone, you return it with 20% interest. That was the rule. You, you add a fifth to it. Zacchaeus is saying, if I stole from anyone, everyone I stole from, I'm giving it back 400%. Which is to say that letting Zacchaeus rob you is a great investment. <laughs> like, if I could get in on that, I'd be doing all right. He, above and beyond by so much, he is turning to God in this moment. I love the way that God's heart is revealed here. I, I, I've come to, to seek and save the lost, Jesus says. The, the, this day, if you go to the next slide, thank you so much, Christine. This day, salvation has come. This, it's happened. It's already accomplished, he says. And in fact... 
This reason, th this man is the prime example of why I've come. Everything I've done, everything God's been preparing for for thousands of years, everything I've spent my whole life doing, it comes to this moment. This was the goal. That I can walk into the home of a sinner, share a meal with them, and declare them righteous. That's what it's all about. In the book Five Habits of Highly Missional People, Michael Frost says about this scene. He says, here, conversion flowered from communion. That, that Jesus was willing to step into the life of of Zacchaeus and share a meal from him. And out of that communion flowered conversion, the change of life. Jesus has the same desire for each of us. Christine, go. Jesus, in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he, he says, and look, notice the language, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. What, what we discover is that Jesus, Jesus loves to commune with people, to share a meal with them. In fact, as we look at Scripture, that truth is everywhere. Je Jesus longs for that experience with you and I. Behold, I am, I am ready. Are you willing to let me in so that we can be together? Because if you let me be the guest of your life, I am automatically the, the Lord of your life. Jesus, in fact, you might say, his life was defined by that communion. The Son of Man, he says to him about himself, this was the reputation he had, has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what the story suggests. Why wouldn't people say that? Here he is in Zacchaeus' home, sharing a meal with this tax collector. And yet everywhere you go in the, in the Gospels, Jesus is sharing a meal. Everywhere. It's, it's one of his primary modes of being. And to be honest, I get it. Well, just look at Scripture. Jesus, he, 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 his ministry begins by going without a meal for 40 days. And then from there, he is constantly feasting. He's constantly drinking. In John chapter 4, he's with the Samaritan woman by the well. Can I have a drink? I'd like to offer you living water that will last for eternity. All you 5,000 who are here to listen to me, let me multiply and, and feed you. You 4,000 who are here to listen to me, let me multiply food and feed you. Yeah, again and again and again in Scripture, Jesus is all about sharing a meal with people. It's how he seeks and saves the lost over and over and over again. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples, and he, one of the things he tells them, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Like, this is Jesus. He started, I don't know if you've heard of Christianity before. There's like a billion of them. Like, he started that thing with this crazy idea of show up places and eat with people. <laughs> like, that's, his, that's his advice, and it is... Again and again, we see this is how Jesus wants people, his people, to live. It is not an exaggeration to say that if you are a Christian, sharing a meal with someone is a spiritual activity. It is every bit as, a, as much a spiritual activity as prayer, as singing, is sitting in a pew or a chair. Like sharing a meal is a spiritual activity. I mean, we have a, a Sabbath dedicated at least once a quarter entirely around a meal. We call it communion. 
And the way Jesus asked us to remember his death and sacrifice is through a meal. When we share a meal, we are operating according to Jesus' will. We, we are acting as spiritual followers of Jesus. And it's, it's, it's nothing fancy, it's just eating with people, drinking with people. I love that idea that Jesus has, that, that conversion flowers from communion. I think that's something we have to, as a church, begin to live out. So I want to challenge you. Challenge you. 21 meals in a week. Give or take. It's more for some, less for us. Throw in, you know, those of you who go grab a, a cup of coffee or tea or posting or juice or a smoothie. I don't know, fill in whatever. There are over 20 opportunities in the week. Will you consider once a week engaging in the spiritual practice of eating with someone else? It, it, that, I know that sounds simple, but truly it is has and is changing the world. It is. Once a week, find someone at church. Just invite them to lunch. If you're, if you're in school, once a week, invite someone to your table. Share your apple juice with them. I don't know. Call someone up at work. Call someone up from school. Call up a family member. Just share a meal with someone. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't need to bring your Bible and do a Bible. No. The, the act of sharing a meal with someone is in and of itself spiritual. It is absolutely at the heart of who Jesus is. What if we were a church that practiced communion amongst ourselves weekly, but simply through eating together. What a family, what a wonder Jesus might do. Let us pray together. Lord, we are here because you decided that this world was worthy of your presence. Exposed though we may have been because of, of sin, you came shared the most important of meals. Like you, Jesus, we, we praise you for your willingness to count us worthy of your presence. And so we invite you in. And Lord, we pray that you would inspire us to share that simple meal, that simple drink with those here in our church family, those around us, we ask, Lord, that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Thank you for worshiping.